Brennan asked me to write a letter to my eighth grade self. I think it's um, for the younger kids who haven't gone through middle school, but I think, I think we could all, well, I think more of you could learn lessons that I had to learn the hard way, and if you do it this way, it should be a little easier. Um, so this is a letter to eighth grade me. Hey buddy, this is you, four years in the future. To prove it's me, I'll tell you some personal things that only we know. First, your favorite movie is Napoleon Dynamite. Second, you can't stand your little brother Ezra. <laughs> Don't worry, he gets better. Third, the thing you are most proud of is how hard you work at swimming. Now that I've proved it's me, I'll tell you something about your surf that I had to learn the hard way. That pride you find in swimming will tear you apart. You will find your identity in how fast you swim, and when you don't meet your own standard, you will stop valuing yourself. Since we are the slowest of learners, it won't stop with swimming. You'll try to fill the God-sized hole in your heart with many insufficient things that will leave you high and dry. Things like academics, popularity, and relationships. I would tell you what to do, but knowing me, I know you wouldn't listen. You're going to have to learn these lessons God's way. And while it's a long, painful road, it's the right road. All I'll do is remind you that when you fail yourself, you still have value because you're made in the image of God. When you're not enough for yourself, God is enough for you. And when you're fighting depression and loneliness, God will be with you, bringing peace that surpasses all understanding. Every year, we pick a student uh, that I'm, I'm sure I can speak on behalf of all of our Oasis leaders that we all look up to. And as Titus said, he wrote that probably for the younger students in the room, but it does benefit all of us. Because if you write a letter to your eighth grade self and tell your eighth grade self what you wish you knew, well, now you know that, and you can do that thing. So the truth is that Titus, thank you, Titus, for what you put into that truths that he shared with you, now you know. Titus is going to do those things, follow those truths. We can as well. That was, that was incredible. Thank you, Titus. Well, we have a quick few minutes to do a challenge from God's Word this morning that I think also is going to apply to all of us, both the younger students that are in the room and us as a church. This was a message shared to God's people in Joshua chapter 3. If you want to turn there, we're just going through the first six verses as a, as a church family, we're going to cover Joshua chapter 3, 1 through 6. But it starts with a question to all of us, uh, but particular to you grads. I'm going to try to find you all now as we share this time. Is today what you thought it would be? For years, as you walked through elementary and middle school and high school, and boy, I can't wait to get out of this or get into that or get my career started, or go to college, and maybe the college that you thought you were going to go to has changed multiple times. But as you had all that anticipation and all that excitement about what you couldn't wait to get to, does today look like you thought it would? Or has it changed? Did you have an idea of what it would look like in the future? And as Titus shared, things do change. Sometimes we learn things the hard way, and what you thought was going to happen changes. As you get to that threshold of, uh, career and college, further education, exiting the home, maybe being out on your own, something has changed that's not how you expected it. Maybe that's where you find yourself grad or church member. Because as you know, and as I despise as somebody who just does not like change, and if you don't believe me, ask Sarah. She can talk to you about it later. Change happens all the time. There's multiple thresholds in life of marriage and child rearing and career changes and church family changes and things change. And a lot of times it's not how you expected it. 
And where we're at in Joshua chapter 3 today is where the, the family of Israel, the church, really, the body, the people of Israel, have come out of the wilderness after decades of wandering. Moses passes away at the end of Deuteronomy, and the mantle of leadership goes to Joshua. The first chapter of Joshua, spies go into the land, and they come back and say, it's ready. We're ready to go into the promised land, this land that has only been a dream for everyone but Moses, who saw it from a mountaintop before he passed away. This promised land that of anticipation, promise, and excitement, it, we're ready. If you know the story, Rahab, the prostitute in Jericho, hid these spies and said, guys, if you want to know what it's like here, everybody's trembling. We're all afraid of you. I know, my family knows that your God is the true God. So they make a deal with Rahab where, where she protects them and they will protect her and she survives the decimation of Jericho. But in between them meeting Rahab and Jericho falling, we read chapter 3 and chapter 4 where the Israelites are now at the threshold of this swollen Jordan River. And for some of them, I'm confident it's not what they expected. First of all, if you look up any picture of the Jordan River, it's a tiny little creek. And you would wonder, why does God even need to dry it up? You could literally like toss everybody over and move on. But no, it's swollen. And not, after, not only that, they just spent 40 years walking across the desert. They're probably ready for a break. So one way or another, I'm confident in saying that for those Israelites gathered at the, at the river bank of the Jordan, they have a lot of anticipation, a lot of excitement, as they look across the river, probably some anxiety. And in the six verses we're going to go through today, God reveals something about his character that's good for all of us. It's good news for you and I, graduate, you and I, church family member. It's good for us as God's people. And then he tells us what to do about it, and what you can do to know that you're following him. So we're going to read these passages and kind of draw out some charges, if you will, for grads. Walking into your future tomorrow, I want you to know what we read here is true, and it's as true for you as it was for the Israelites thousands of years ago as they stood on the banks of their Jordan River and looked at things that were both exciting and terrifying that God had brought them to. So let's start in Joshua chapter 3, but before that, we'll pray. Father, I thank you for this word and who you are, the God that you've decided to be and, and have treated us with love and compassion, have led us faithfully. Father, starting with the story of your people, Israelites, seeing how you led them so patiently, and even after they failed multiple times, you still fulfilled your promise, Father. Help us to see that in this passage. God, use these moments to do something for these graduates, for this church, from your word, because I know it's important, powerful, and effective. Glorify yourself and, and do something good for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So did it turn out how you expected? We're going to look at what it turned out like for the Israelites in a moment. Is this on my laptop? Interesting. All right, so we're going to start with Joshua chapter 3, verse 1. Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Shittim. And they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. Shittim means the acacia grove. Thank you. Shittim means the acacia grove. So think of it like they've been in the desert. Finally, they get to camp out, probably in a little wooded area. But they have got to get closer to the Jordan River. They've been out a little farther away from the Jordan River Joshua was going to motivate the troops to get them over to the Jordan River. So they lodged there before they passed over. At the end of three days of camping out on the banks of the Jordan River, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people in verse 2. Watch what they say here. As soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. So let's back up. They've camped on the bank of the Jordan River now for three days. So now they're literally staring across this threshold, looking at tomorrow. Look at those fields. They're going to be ours. Look at those flocks. They're going to be ours. Look at that fortress, though. Look at that city. Look at those people. So there's a mix of excitement and anticipation and anxiety as they look at what's about to become theirs. For three days, they are on the threshold of it, looking at both some gifts and some challenges. What does Joshua say to the people? He says, first, watch for the Ark of the Covenant. If you're not familiar with the 
incredible story. The Ark of the Covenant is incredibly important. In Exodus, God tells Moses how to build this ark. It's going to be beautiful, golden, basically this chest that's carried by the people of Israel. And inside it, in Hebrews chapter 9, it says there's the tablets, the Ten Commandments, still the law, the very word of God carved on rock. There's manna, a symbol of God's provision for his people. There's Aaron's staff that budded, and it's carried across the Jordan River. It's going to be carried across the Jordan River because it represents the, the physical, tangible presence of God in the people of Israel. Now there's, on top of the ark, there's this, these two cherubim with arched angel wings facing each other. And God says to Moses in Exodus, this is where I will talk to you. And once a year, what the Israelites would do is they'd sprinkle blood from a sacrificed lamb on that lid of the ark called the mercy seat. Atoning, the, the priest would atone for his sins and for the sins of the people. So this ark represented all of this, the presence of God in the people, the sacrifice of atonement, allowing God to maintain his presence in the people so that they as a sinful people could be in the presence of a holy God. His provision and his law was all bound up and represented in this. So this is going to go before them into the promised land. Lord your God means Yahweh your Elohim. Yahweh, the, Mos the God that spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. Your king, your ruler, goes in forward in front of you into battle across the Jordan River. So that's what's happening here. It's really exciting. But the Israelites do need to do something. They need to follow him. So as they see the Ark of the Covenant move, Joshua's word to the Israelites is follow it. Go wherever it goes. Now, a side note that's helpful for some of the context here is some scholars think there's probably about a million Israelites at this point, lots of them. Later on in this passage, you see just some warriors listed, and there's 40,000 of them. So no matter what the number is, it's a giant mass of people. And for each one of those, individually and corporately as a people, they have to follow God. Grads and church, this is, this is our charge to you. As you leave us, or some of you will kind of stick around, but as you head into this future, you have to follow God into your future. See, I told you they were camped on the bank of the, the Jordan River. Well, I have to imagine there were guys who were like, what are we waiting for? Let's go. Let's just get over there and do this. You know, there's always somebody in the pack, right, that's at the head, wants to lead. It's like the Marines of the Israelites. They want to go and take that beach. They want to get over there. Marines, I love you. I just want you to know. And then there's people at the back of the pack, though, that says, hey, we just did 40 years walking through the desert. I am worn out. I am tired. I'm just glad I made it here. As they camp there, there's all these feelings happening. He says, you don't go on your own. If you feel like you're at the back of the pack, know that you're not going on your own. If you feel like you're ready to lead the charge, know you're not going on your own. And not until I say so. So grads, wherever you are in that group, you think you're spiritually strong and you're ready to lead, praise God. You're not going alone, though, and you can't go without him. And if you don't know God closely or don't even know if you know him yet, we'll see that he wants to be known by you in a moment. But know this, you're not going alone. He'll go with you. So the same truth is true for all of us. We have to follow God into our future. We'll see how to do that here in a moment. He continues in verse 4 as we continue. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it almost 2,000 cubits in length. Yet do not come near it. Well, that's kind of hard, right? And so it might make you think, if you're familiar with some of the, the holiness nature of the Ark of the Covenant, and if you touch it, you, you die, you're struck dead, it might make you think of that for a moment. Well, context is key here, and we'll see in just a second what God says is such good, good news for his people. Remember, that's that massive group of people, and if you just kind of have this cluster, you ever try to Lead, uh, lead a group of students from in the middle of the pack. If you haven't, uh, we have some openings in Oasis. You can come help us uh, lead. From the middle of the pack is not where you lead from, right? And God's going to tell you how important this is to him right now, but he says, I'm going to be about a half mile ahead of you, but you can follow me. And the reason he says this, he tells us, in order that you may know the way you shall go. I told you at the beginning, grads and church, that this tells us something about God's character. And what, what this phrase tells us is he desires to be seen and followed. He's not hiding out from the Israelites or being mysterious about maybe we'll cross today, maybe we won't, maybe I'll be over here, maybe I'll be there. You'll know where I am. You'll know where to follow me. And this is for everybody. 
again, it's not lost on me that, that this is a massive group of people and you have all sorts of abilities. You have people who are out there, the Levitical priests, the teachers and leaders of Israel. You have the warriors who are just, like I said, ready. Let's do it. Forge the river. Take the town. Let's do it. But I got to imagine in a million people, there are a lot of weary souls. There are a lot of people who feel kind of like they're at the back of the pack and stra straggling. And in this church, I know, I know in a church this size, I've, we've talked to you. You know there's some weary souls and there's some people who are ready to take the hill. So if you're a weary soul, sometimes the things that we hear is, I can't teach like so-and-so, I can't lead like so-and-so. I don't have that gift, I don't have that skill. Well, you have other gifts and you have other skills. And no matter where you fit in this mass, grads, teachers, and this group, this body of people, God wants to be known, seen by you, and lead you. He wants to lead you into your future. Same for these Israelites. Watch what he says here, though. This could be said to each one of us, but particularly you grads. For you have not passed this way before. Now, I've been through a grad service, and I've graduated. Sarah and I were talking a couple uh, yesterday about how she went through a grad service in this very church. We've done this before, but we don't know what our future holds. I don't know what a job change is going to be like or a, a family change is going to be like or a cultural change is going to be like. There are still unknowns in my life, but grads, there's some unknowns in your life today, right? You don't know what college is like. You don't know what your career is going to be like. You don't know what moving out from your household is like, being out on your own is like. But the other truth about God that he shows us here is he knows what that's like. You haven't passed this way before, but I have. See, he's been in this land before with Abraham. He's seen it himself. He knows what he's leading his people into. And it's such a comfort to me to think about how he's telling his people, you've not been here before, but this is not a problem. I'm going to be with you. That's why we have to follow him. No matter where you're at in that pack, I think it's such a beautiful thing that God cares about stragglers. If we were going to continue to read chapter 3, and then chapter 4 is kind of a retelling of the crossing, he actually stops in the middle he, being the presence of God around the Ark of the Covenant, stops in the middle of the river and waits till everyone passes by him. That would really matter to you if you were in the middle or the back of the pack. Oh boy, God is right here. Right now, he's here. He hasn't left me behind. I thought it was going to take me forever, but he's here with me. And then he follows them back across. I think this is amazing. So you have to follow God in your future, but th this, this comes at you in two ways, church. There's a necessity here. First, you have to trust him like the, the uh, we're so used to talking about the disciples. The people of Israel had to choose to see and follow the Ark of the Covenant. Now, you and I don't follow the Ark of the Covenant, but we follow something better now. The personified physical presence of God did come to earth. Christ came to earth, God and man, in the flesh, touchable Jesus, and showed us how to live, led his disciples like he leads us. And now we have the word. The Ark of the Covenant contains these tablets, the word of God. Now we have the word of God. See, Jesus was all these things. He was the word of God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God. He broke his body and gave it for us. He was the manna, the provision for us. He was the new life after death where Aaron's dead staff came to life, budded out. He's the new life after death for you and I. And he's the propitiation or the payment, that atonement for our sins, the sprinkling of the blood. So first, to follow God into your future, it's necessary. It's, it's required that you have to trust him, but you have to trust Christ as your savior. The rest of this will be impossible. You can't do the rest of this on your own strength unless you first know him. And then believer, those of you who already know Christ, we have to trust him with all those anxieties and anticipations. If you feel like you know what you're going into or you don't, you have to trust him either way. Like I said, if you think you're at the beginning of the pack or you know you're struggling, we have to trust him either way. So it kind of works in a couple ways. So we'll continue here. Joshua in, chapter, in verse 5 says to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. So how do we know that we're trusting God? How do we actually know we're the, the people of God that are truly trusting him both as our Lord and Savior, but also with our anxieties and our future. We're following him truly. Well, there's the step that comes first. We've trusted Christ as our Savior. To show if we are doing that or not, we consecrate ourselves, same as it was for the Israelites. 
Exodus talks about this consecration process where you clean your clothing. You, you are clean and ready for service. But you also abstain from behaviors that would normally be okay for you to do. Grads, this is, this is going to be your life here in a short few moments. When you go into a world that says, you can do this, this is okay, this is perfectly acceptable. There are going to be things that you're encouraged to do and even told as a Christian, you can do this, you can believe this, don't worry. You could totally embrace this lifestyle, decision, behavior. But God is saying to his people, if you're truly mine and you've trusted me, you're set apart, consecrated, cleansed on the outside and abstaining from behaviors that the world that you're stepping into, the world that we're in, church, is going to normalize and encourage us to do. Because many of you are going to go off into a secular workplace or a secular university and find that everyone around you wants to normalize you to them. The Israelites faced the same thing. They, they joined this foreign nation as they had to drive out these enemies. There was plenty of pressure to follow other gods and live other lifestyles. So God says to his people and says to us, following me into your future begins with consecrating yourself, setting yourself apart, knowing if you've tru truly trusted me is displayed or shown by if you're set apart from the world around you. And then I love this passage, and grads, this is true for you. He's going to do wonders among you. He's going to do stuff that's unexplainable but for the presence of a powerful God. Titus, you got to share that with us, but I'm sure if we had a chance for every grad to write a letter to their eighth grade self, we could hear how God did something in your life this year or recently. There were difficult things in your high school career, distance learning, Zoom class, cancellations, sports seasons thrown out of whack, physical injuries, just to name a few things, and God is going to do wonderful things among you. But he's speaking to his people who are already deciding to follow him. So how do you do this? How do you know if you've actually trusted him? Well, if your life is set apart, that's a really good clue. If you're abstaining from behaviors that the world is about to or already saying, this is fine, you can do this. Don't worry, join us in this. If you're setting yourself apart for God's purposes, this is how you know you've trusted him. And if you're not, this is a necessary step to follow God into your future. Otherwise, you're following yourself. Otherwise, you're following your own goals. I want to go in there and do that. I'm on the banks of this threshold, this Jordan River, and here's what I want to accomplish. This is the litmus test for if you're truly setting your life apart to be following him into your future. So wrapping up, Joshua says to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. The word people is mentioned so many times in this chapter. God is talking to his people, this group. At the end of the chapter, something cool happens, though, and they become a nation. My final encouragement to you guys, grads, church family, this is the importance of being a part of a local church. This is the importance of doing life with other believers who are going to reinforce being consecrated, following a trusting God, not being like the world when they say, hey, you can do this. This is okay for you. This is the importance of finding a local church, whether you're here in Allegan or you're somewhere abroad. See, God speaks to his people expecting individual behaviors, individual faithfulness that leads to corporate benefit. That's the importance of being a part of this church. Now, I know, I know in the people of Israel, there were difficulties between people in a pack that big. There were some personality conflicts. And in a church, the same thing is true. But we're following Christ. We're following a faithful God not ourselves. That will lead to peace and unity. Christ actually asked for this in his prayer in John 17. He asked to make his disciples, make his church unified. He asked that they'd be set apart, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. So this is done two ways, by being a part of a local church that also is Bible-believing and preaching. Grads and church family, do this with others. Do this with a local church that's Bible-believing and, and friendly. This is my last encouragement to you kind of as we close, church family, but also grads. It's now up to you. You're going to go out on your own. Nobody will know if you go to church or not. Because you can tell your family or you can tell us whatever you want. You, you can. But my encouragement to you is, is much like for the Israelites, this is better done with others who are going to reinforce the teaching that you're hearing here. As a part of this church family, Awana, Kids Zone. Oasis, we've been pointing you to God's word 
this whole time. Lord willing, you've heard things that have changed your life, changed the way you viewed God. I encourage you to continue. Find a local church that teaches the word and values fellowship. And you'll have something to counteract the forces of the world where they say, come and do this, live this way. You'll have strength and unity with fellow brothers and sisters. Follow God in your future knowing that you can trust him. He waits for everyone, not, not willing that anyone should perish. He doesn't want any stragglers. He's faithful and trustable. Consecrate, set your, part, set your life apart, and do that with others in this season. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these grads, and we give you praise for the young men and women that they are and for the families that they represent. I'm so thankful for the families that are part of this church what you're doing in them. Father, this is hard. You knew it was hard. You knew how we'd feel about it. And that's why you showed us through the lives of the Israelites how you were faithful to them no matter what, how you led them so patiently, how you waited for them, and how you did fulfill your promises. Thank you for sending us your son, who is the fulfillment of all the, the ark and the law and the prophets talked about and represented. And it's so much better yet, Father, seeing your son, give his life so that we could be your people. Just ask that all of these grads and everyone here would embrace that and choose to follow you, would accept your son as their Lord and Savior, and that they would walk forward, set apart as your church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.